Eddie, but I'll say it again. I want to thank Warners because it's not cheap, it's not easy, but um, they said yes to do this, which is uh, a terrific thing. Thank you, Pammy, for still over there. Um, but um, e yeah, if you got a lot of money, you can do it. It's not too much. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I, I have seen it, and it's really, really great. And it, um, it's funny because the film is now, I think we're further away from when the film takes place than we were, you know, uh, when we made it. So it starts to kind of feel like a movie, more and more like a movie from that time, you know, just in mm -hmm. distance. But um, it was relatively easy, you know, Robert uh, Elswood, who shot the film, did such a wonderful job and the negative was so strong um, that we were able to, with the help of Photocam, make um, a blow up photochemically. For any nerds who you know know normally might, you might do it a 70 millimeter blow up digitally these days. It's kind of a bit easier, um, but this really was we were able to do it and it, and it looks great and, and 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 it sounds great too. So yeah. Have, have, has anybody, I'm sorry, have, has anybody not seen this movie? <laughs> Well, I'll try not to do too many spoilers for them, but you were in the hot tub with Burt Reynolds. <laughs> I was. Yeah, we started poetry. <laughs> what was your just what was your favorite day uh, on this on this film? What is the day that when you think about this film now, you're like, oh, that's the day, or that that was the favorite moment? Me? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. It's hard to say a favorite. You know, this whole thing was like an amazing process. You know, it's funny, Paul is now this amazing legend of a director who's done so much and is held in such high esteem. At this time, he was hustling to get a gig. <laughs> and so all the months and everything leading up to making this movie were this really special time in my life, I think in our lives. And um, so the favorite moments that jump out, really, it's like a stream. I remember getting to the end of the shoot and thinking, that was the most fun summer I've ever had. Yeah. Um, and uh, the, you know, the ensemble of actors and everyone, just getting to feel like part of this family was really a, a special thing. Um, we were just talking about at dinner before we came here that <laughs> Paul cruelly made me do a magic trick in front of Ricky Jay. <laughs> you don't know Ricky Jay is passed away, but he was one of the great magicians of the world. So as a child magician, I was really humiliated by that. <laughs> if I had to do, but yeah. And how was it as a young director? I mean, you you directed Philip Baker Hall before, but you had like Richly, I, mean, I guess you had done before, yeah. but you had some titans, or Ricky Jay, these older uh, gentlemen. Was it, were you uh, timid at first, or were you just sh shut out, straight out? Um. No, you know, I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't timid, um, I, was, I was confident, I was probably overly confident, but I think the confidence came from, you know, it's, it's easy to have confidence when you have great actors, because you don't, you don't really know any better, they're, they're so versatile, and able to give you what you need, um, you know, you become timid when, you know, you don't know how to help an actor, at least at that time, I, I you know, my first movie was with, Sam Jackson, Gwyneth Paltrow, Phil Baker, and John Riley. You know, I mean, I was spoiled rotten, so I didn't know what it was like to the challenge of working with somebody who might be cranky or mm. might not know their lines or something mm. like that. Um, so, and, you know, about Bert. Mm. Um, I was intimidated a little bit by Burt Reynolds at first. Um, I think we all were, but we were also excited to work with him. Um, the, the possibilities of working with him. Um, and we had a lot of terrific um, people from the porn industry who were, you know, uh, so I, they were not shy about removing their clothes, you know, <laughs> that was really helpful, you know. Because <laughs> I, you know, I didn't want, you know, the young film director, and you didn't, it was, and that was kind of, you know, we had to test, get in situations that could have been uncomfortable, um, have people remove their clothes and stuff like that. And, 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 yeah, the, the, they were up for it and, and just made it, you know, like not a big deal. Um, so that was the comfort of working with actors who are there for you. It doesn't make you timid, it makes you, it really, make, it feeds you. And, and if anything, you feel like, well, they're dancing, they're, 
there, you know, all this energy and they're giving it to you, 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 you feel more pressure to do right by them. And everyone was, did such, it was such a great ensemble cast, I imagine as each day as you went through, you got more and more confident, everyone felt like this is really something happening, especially the opening shot of this film, yeah. but the opening, once you must have accomplished that with all the choreography, can you, can you talk about a little shooting that? Uh, yeah, I think we ended up shooting that pr pretty deep into making the movie, so we had a little bit of confidence to do it. Maybe not too deep, but um, we had, um, you know, a terrific assistant director, John Wildermuth, uh, to m help make that all that happen, and a great cast, a great steady cam operator, Andy Shuttleworth. Um, um, you know, it's funny. I think I, the, to your question is that we did we did do like a lot of rehearsals beforehand, and that there was a kind of instant um, great camaraderie amongst the kind of gang of, of, of guys part part of the movie, like John and, and, and Mark and, and Phil and Thomas Jane, and um, so that that was really helpful. That by the time we started, we did, and we talked about it enough. Certainly, John and I had. I've been you know kind of desperate to try to make this movie for years. Um, so that when we started, we we were not we were not going to lose any time. You know, there was no there was no and there wasn't that much time and, and to do all that we were trying to do. We were just attacking every single day, and every day there was no break. There was no break. Every day was felt like it was a big scene. Um, hmm. Yeah, I remember we shot we rehearsed the the dance number that happens in that first sequence in a roller rink across the street from where the club was. <laughs> that was interesting. And I, I want to point something else out about the movie, which is that at the time that the movie was being put together, porn was still this major taboo. It existed, of course, on video and everything, and people were aware of it, but it wasn't so seeped into the culture like it has been since the internet, you know? At the time, people had to be convinced, their agents had to be convinced, Hey, you know, don't worry. You can associate your client with this movie that's about porn. You know, like it was actually kind of people viewed it as a big risk. And I remember we were nominated for like best ensemble or something at the SAG Awards. I remember just sitting at this table off to the side, and I really felt like a porn star. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, everyone thinks we're really porn stars. Shoot this over to the side here in this table. And eat your filthy chicken. <laughs> it was real humanizing. Uh, it wasn't just porn. It was like Julian Moore's get like everyone. Well, you you know, to what John said, you have to understand that I was like 25 years old and had a script that was like 180 pages, and you know that had like it was. Like all, like all the porn, all the drugs, and everything else, and I've been there. I made my first film, so there was a lot of confusion about exactly what this might be. And two two great things happened. First is Mike DeLuca, who ran New Line Cinema at the time, and made incredible films um, uh, at that time. Read it and trusted me, and we really hit it off. So there was the backing of that. So that's that's a great that's a great place to start. But more to the point was that when Julianne Moore said, said yes, that was a really big deal because other actors have always, and especially when she was starting out, and so they were like, if she's doing it, it's gotta have something. It really, it was like a seal of approval and legitimacy from her meant a lot to other actors. She would worked with Don Cheadle, so suddenly Don paid a little bit more attention to it. Um, I think she also had already done a scene with Altman with her pants off. <laughs> so this was nothing to her. You don't want it at all. You don't want. You don't want it all. I'm like, no, just, just the top part. So, can you tell us more about the struggle? How did this? When I watch it, I always go, "How did this get made?" Like, <laughs> okay, well, it got made because I convinced Mike that Leonardo DiCaprio and Jack Nicholson were going to be in it. <laughs> million dollars, and I was like, no problem. And then, um, you know, if you follow this kind of stuff, quite famously, Leonardo decided to do the Titanic instead of the Titanic, which he regrets now, but I, I think he did all right. This is fine. And um, 
I don't think I could have got, I don't think I got Jack Nicholson to read the script eventually. I don't think he did uh, get to him. I don't think it got to him. That was hard. Mm. But that's okay, because that would have been something else. And Bert was always somebody that was really, really right for it. And, and you know, it happens in casting that you, you really do end up with the people who are supposed to be there. And, mm. and, and Leo, Leo did suggest Mark. They had just done the basketball diaries. You have to understand that Mark, you know, he was known as this rapper and underwear model, and he was very concerned, like, you just want me to be in this because I'll, I'll be in my underwear. Uh, and I met with him and he was just electric. He was so fantastic. And actually I saw Jamie Foley's movie Fear that he was in. He was great in that. And so- You didn't want the underwear at all. <laughs> <laughs> I saw, you know, it is, I see him mark his body. I'm like, this is good, this is good. <laughs> Just shooting the Alfred Molina scene? Shh. Yes, of course. So the Alfred Molina scene we shot about, I think it was about five days. It was maybe four or five days, which is a really long time um, to be firecrackers going off and smoke and everything else. Still have PTSD of those fucking firecrackers. The one thing I can remember about that scene was, was feeling like after we rehearsed it and wrapped it out, being like, Something nagged at me that something was not quite right, and that, that is, there's a problem that I can't put my finger on, and I don't know what it is, and I guess we should just start shooting. And I'm really afraid because it's the, it's the end of the movie. And then when we ro roll and the first firecracker went off for real, I was very relieved. I said, well, yeah. that was what was missing, is that we didn't do a rehearsal with a firecracker. Mm -hmm. So when he started throwing those firecrackers, my friend Joe Chan, and you see everybody jump, I thought, well, actually, this, this could be pretty good. <laughs> I guess I don't want to ruin something too much for you, but anybody who's seen the movie, maybe this is good for you to know, is that if you can remember, or maybe when you see it coming up in the movie, in that scene, when there's a very, very long take on Mark's face, and he just absolutely blanks out. That is not something that was planned or scripted. <laughs> That was like the last shot after five days of doing this scene. He, like, his mind just stopped. It went <laughs> completely off. And he didn't know where he was. And he was like, and if you're watching as a director, you're like, this is fucking magic. <laughs> insane volley of M16 fire into the house wow. because he had a rifle and so the house just gets sprayed with bullets and the, we cut out of it sooner than that or Paul cut out of it sooner than that in the edit but that room was was completely wired with 2,000 squibs or something <laughs> so it was this sense on the set like we're literally in a tinderbox. <laughs> the whole fucking thing could explode any second. So it, it gave it this edge, like just being on that set. <laughs> Your friendship with Dirk when they when they first meet is one of the best scenes. It's like uh, you immediately fall in love with both these guys. Uh, was that all on the page, or uh, did you rehearse to to find that relationship? We didn't rehearse that scene, and I think a lot of it is on the. Age, um, but when you have John, you know, you have to let him improvise because it's always better than when he does. Um, but he also knew that it was one shot, that he could do it and then do one little thing. So, you know, the Han Solo thing, he improvised. <laughs> he did, or maybe I suggested it and he did come below that. I don't remember. But, but, um, but that one, that's one instance where I think, it, I think it's pretty close to the script. I don't remember. But I think it was one of the first scenes that I shot with Mark. 
So it was, you were right. clever to put us in that first position like that. I had to Graham does such a great job, and she has to do it on roller skates. So she did, she she did not really know how to roller skate. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing what her learning curve was. I've mm -hmm. seen her maybe a couple months before, kind of not knowing how to roller skate. To she did. I mean, you know, she went full Daniel Day Lewis on it. Never <laughs> <laughs> took her skates off. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, over rocky terrain and everything, and she just. Became Heather's such an underrated actress, I think. I mean, mm -hmm. she's sort of an icon, but she's really so incredible. Um, I, I look at particularly the scenes that she has with Julianne and the, you know, having a good time. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, and Phil, once again, with his brilliant performance and such an unflattering portrayal of someone's self. And it's amazing to look at, like when you look at the master or the mattress king, and they're so confident, mm -hmm. and his ability to play completely unconfident. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, can you talk just a little bit about, about Phil in this? And I just thought, you know, he makes uh, Dirk Diggler sexier because <laughs> of his love of it. You know, I think it's, it, it, I, I think it was probably something for Phil to set aside all vanity, you know, and Phil had that, um, that ability to do that, you know, some actors might not go all the way or they might get that costume fitting and go, you know, this is really hard for me. And even if it was hard for Phil, he doesn't show it and he's just gonna play that line and that's what he did. And it's, you know, that, that what him and Mark Bridges, the costume designer, came up with helped to push forward you know, what, what's going on with, with, with Scotty, Scotty J. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've never worked with someone who gave less of a shit about vanity. I <laughs> did a play with him on Broadway, and we would have to do these events, and I always would overcompensate with the way I dressed. You know, like, all right, I'm going to Sardi's. I guess I'm supposed to be fancy and wear a suit. And Phil literally has the same dirty chinos and hoodie that he had on the day before. Like, this is who I am. If you don't like it, too fucking bad. Like, I'm not gonna get dressed up for Sardi's. Like, I rode my bike here. And there was something really great about a fierceness about him. He had his eye on the important things. But he, it also, you know, he also would never take his coat off. If he rode his bike all the way there, and it was like, you know, 40 degrees out and it was cold, he'd sit in the restaurant in his coat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also not going to stay very long either. <laughs> you know, Bert wasn't, like, he wasn't at the top of his fame at this point, right? And uh, he did Deliverance, he's great in that, but he never... And this was, to me, it's still the greatest performance he's ever done. And when you watch him, you're like, oh, you're a great movie star, but this was in you the whole time? Hmm. Like, it's so good. You're like, you could have, instead of being just a movie star, you, I feel like you could have you done that. Yeah, he's so, he's so terrific in the movie, you know. And it wasn't the easiest at times, because he, he, he could be challenging, but, right. and I was young, and, but I did see it you know, when we did the print, and I looked back and I watched his performance with some distance and I hadn't seen in a long time. And that was one of the, the biggest things that I took away was just how remarkable he is in the movie. Um, I think he, um, you know, he was the oldest person on the set and, and also had, he, he was the one who would, he could look at you or look at you and just like, you were in diapers at this time. I was here and the biggest movie star in the world, so I know how to get into a fucking jacuzzi. Watch that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that kind of stuff. You're like, these little details of like, look at how it gets in the jacuzzi and how it does, like, turn the bubbles on for me, do all this stuff, like, all this stuff. It's just like, it's just like, it's like syrup coming out of them. And, or when he does that scene with Roller Girl and Kyle Lennox, our friend who's here, he, in the back of the limo, you know, and he's on the mic with the tuxedo on. He's, um, he just owns that kind of stuff, and, 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 he, and he has a tenderness too, you know, um, Bert did in, in some of his best performances, it's kind of like tough guy stuff, but he's, he was very, very tender um, underneath all that kind of machismo stuff. He's also a contemporary of like Marlon Brando, mm -hmm. you know, like that's where Bert saw himself. In the, in the in the world of film was what those were his peers, you know. And then he went on to be this very charming kind of raconteur, 
uh, you know, the sexiest man alive for maybe the longest run anybody's ever had in America, <laughs> right? I mean, Tom Selleck, maybe a little bit longer, but, you know, so it's funny that you, you name check Deliverance and then Boogie Nights, but Bert, Bert is very underrated, you know, his charm and his ability with comedy, um, he, was, he, was, he was really an amazing actor that, that took the opportunities he was given, but... Mm -hmm. I think of him in that context all the time. You know, he got, he told us one time Marlon Brando like insulted him at a restaurant. He's like, I knew where he lived. <laughs> <laughs> so I left that restaurant and I went straight to his house. And I waited in the front yard for him to come home. <laughs> I was gonna kick his ass. <laughs> I was like, what happened, Bertie? He's like, he didn't come home, so I just left. <laughs> It's like a nowhere story, but it makes you realize, like, oh, he was like ready to go toe to toe with Marlon Brando. <laughs> okay, that's who we're dealing with. Well, Bert would have won that too. Yeah. Bert was a strong. He is a strong, strong guy. We can go on forever just about the actors in this film, but then there's, of course, I want to mention William H Macy uh, yeah. in this, and. Uh, also, there's, I mean, I just watched it, but they, I think people brought this up before. But there's a line he says that doesn't make any sense when his wife's there. Right. <laughs> he, did, he couldn't do that on purpose. He did it by accident. He said, I'm sorry, I'll correct that. And then he did it again. He said, I don't know what's wrong with this. It's too late. I think that's going to go. <laughs> and it's funny coming from him. He's one of those actors, like, he gets every every single thing that you write, even if there's a typo. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. He's a manic guy, so everything is exactly as you want. But he had some kind of, I don't know if it would be Freudian or not. <laughs> it was a weird slip. And it, was, it was pretty good. And yeah, and it just made the film. Um, um, yeah. Um, but, uh, one last thing. Is that, uh, my, my, our friend Ricky Jay, who passed away, um, kept journals uh, every day of his life. And I, my, my, our mutual friend Dan uh, has been transcribing these. And so there's mm -hmm. journal entries from his days on, on, on Boogie Nights, uh, which I've been looking back at. And hopefully that'll be shared in some publication or something mm -hmm. like that. But it's pretty fantastic seeing it through Ricky's point of view. Uh, and like kind of, it's really not his job as an actor. He's, an actor. he's, the, he's busy being the best magician in the world. <laughs> so he kind of turns up to these days where he's got to direct, you know, Summer in Sky, lesbians and the porno, and just do all this kind of stuff. And it's, it's kind of, it's, it's amazing to, to go through that. Um, one of his great memories was the first rehearsal meeting. Um, I think the quote is something like, I think it's a terrific cast. I met Julianne Moore, who's lovely, and I met John Riley, who's lovely. I met Mark Wahlberg, who seems great. He had a very large, uh, he had a very large plate of potato salad. <laughs> only Ricky would notice that. <laughs> I just loved it. Yeah, it probably the last time Mark had carbs. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, everyone's in honor of Ricky Jake. Uh, let's watch some magic. Alright, ladies and gentlemen.